Welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be watching us around the world. We will go ahead and get started. Just so that everyone knows from the very beginning, we will have simultaneous language interpretation in English, Portuguese, and Spanish. Please look at the bottom of your Zoom screen and off to the right, you should see the interpretation button. Please choose which language you prefer for the webinar and go into it, English, Portuguese, or Spanish. And also, in addition to selecting your language, select to mute the original audio so you don't have interference. My name is Jim Barbarak. Uh, I will be the moderator for this webinar that is focused on the results from the public use component of the Partnership for the Conservation of Amazon Biodiversity. Let me start by first welcoming uh, all of you today from around the world to what we envision will be a positive and uplifting conversation about the success of the program over the past five plus years. As we all know, stories that bring positivity and hope right now are not only welcome, but very much needed considering all that we have all been through this past year. And fortunately, this partnership has a lot of positive success stories to share. I am the co-director of the Center for Protected Area Management at Colorado State University. Our center is proud to be one of the implementing partners that supported the US Forest Service uh, International Programs and the Chico Menges Institute for Biodiversity Conservation, known as the CIMIBIO, in this unique, impactful partnership that you will be hearing about today. The overall purpose of this webinar is to share some of the results and highlights from the public use component of this partnership. We will hear from both USAID representatives and US Forest Service International Program reps, and they will provide us with an overview of the partnership, which included multiple components uh, and public use is just one of them. Then we will have a conversation with uh, representatives of the implementing partners of the US Forest Service, of ISEMI-BIO, which is Brazil's Federal Protected Areas Agency, and the University of Montana. As moderator, I will engage with them in a conversation, uh, we're not gonna be using PowerPoints today, uh, about different aspects of the program. Then towards the end of the session, Suleni Cotto from the US Forest Service Brazil program will be reviewing the questions that we're gonna ask you to put in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and we'll select some of those to ask of our panelists. I'd like to take a few minutes to quickly go over a few logistical items that will help keep us on track today. First, you can use the chat function for general engagements or comments. Like right now, we'd like for everyone to just give a, a shout out of where they are tuning in from in the chat function. Uh, then if you have questions for the panelists, please use that question and answer or Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. This will be the easiest way for us to track the questions and be able to answer, answer some of them. Now, we realize that we probably won't get to all of your questions today in just one hour but we're going to uh, basically record all of those. And uh, we promise that on a website and you will get a link to that website, we will put answers to all the questions we don't get to today uh, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, we will also put a link to where you can uh, look and uh, download the final synthesis report, which is the detailed report on the public use component of the partnership for the past five years. And my colleague, Aaron Hicks, will put some of these links in the chat function. So be monitoring the chat function so that you can download this information and have access to uh, the uh, rest of the questions and answers in our website later. Also, if anyone has any technical issues, they can't hear, they can't talk, uh, there's any problems with quality, please put a note in the chat and uh, Aaron Hicks and Lorena Brewster uh, are monitoring the chat room and we'll try to deal with any technical issues we might have, like sound or video quality. So with that, let's go ahead and get a bit of background and context about this unique partnership from USAID. I'd like to invite Ted Gare, the mission director for USAID Brazil, to kick us off with some opening comments. Thanks, Ted, for joining us. Thanks, Jim, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. 
Um, it's great to be here. Uh, thank you all for being here today to participate in this webinar that's highlighting the excellent collaboration between Brazil and the United States to expand the capacity uh, to design and implement public use programs in Brazil's protected areas. It's a pleasure to represent my team here at the United States Agency for International Development Mission in Brazil, USAID, uh, where I serve as, as the mission director. The United States Forest Service and USAID have worked together with, uh, in Brazil for the last 25 years. It's a long partnership uh, working with our Brazilian partners. Uh, it, this partnership is a cornerstone of our Partnership for the Conservation of Amazon Biodiversity Program, the PCAB program, which is our bilateral program with the Brazilian government. And together with our Brazilian partners, uh, this program has accomplished significant achievements over these decades. And you're gonna hear more about that over this current five year period. Uh, but the technical knowledge and, and experiences shared between our two countries has truly resulted in, increase, in increased biodiversity conservation in the Amazon. So I'd like, to, I'd like to thank the US Forest Service Brazil team for organizing this event. Um, also thanks to Jim uh, from Colorado State University for facilitating. Uh, and of course, many thanks to um, our government of Brazil partners uh, that are represented here by the Chico Mendes Institute for Biodiversity Conservation, uh, ECMBio. Um, our shared efforts have co-designed and implemented innovative programming that is strengthening the capacity of real Brazil's environment agencies to improve the management of the Amazon's protected area systems. And importantly, this, this also includes indigenous lands. Uh, through various courses, workshops, seminars, technical visits to the United States, and field-based planning exercises, our collaboration has helped ECM Bio staff and other partners develop the critical skills uh, and to better apply science to public use planning. And with these skills, we've, we've seen concrete results. Uh, ECM Bio has been able to expand visitor management by 15%. And they've also increased public use activities by 30%. And, and these increases have resulted in additional visitors to public lands, which leads to increased economic gains, uh, enhanced experiences for the visitors, and increased income for parks and guides. Our partnership uh, incorporates community and regional engagement into all trail planning and route development projects. And so this directly benefits local communities and partners and provides them with hands-on learning in all stages of the design, construction, and maintenance of a variety of trail initiatives across Brazil. This includes, for example, the creation of Hedge Trias, a national network of long distance trails that links 59 trails maintained by more than 3000 volunteers. Additionally, our joint programming has helped to foster uh, tourism and improve public use management of some of the world's most enchanting wilderness within the Brazilian Amazon. So building stewardship and a constituency for national parks and forests is critical for supporting conservation efforts. And USAID is proud of the work that we've all uh, accomplished together. Um, I'm also uh, excited to note that USAID plans to expand its work with ECMBU and other Brazilian partners uh, like the US Forest Service in the area of fire management cooperation. Uh, this will be with ECMBU, with IBAMA, uh, the Institute of Environment and Renewable Natural Resources, and other Brazilian partners in 2021. So we're, we're, we're excited about uh, starting up this program as well. And, and just one more final reflection. Um, I, was, I was born and raised in, in the state of Oregon in the United States. And I grew up uh, hiking and exploring the, the wonderful national parks and forests of the beautiful Pacific Northwest. And, and I remember uh, 
in the late 1980s and early 1990s, uh, there was a big controversy regarding the protection of the spotted owl, uh, which had been designated as an endangered species. And, and this required the immediate halt uh, of timber sales on public lands. And the debate over the spotted owl played out across the United States. And, and it actually led to hostilities between environmentalists and those working in the lumber industries. And, it, and, and in many of the Pacific Northwest small towns whose economies relied on the lumber mills, it even, it even led to violence. And so, you know, these issues, you know, were, are very complex. And the controversy, which was portrayed as, as a struggle between loggers' jobs and the protection of spotted owls, ancient forest habitat, it, it was extremely complicated to, to, to resolve and to deal with. And, you know, like many of us living there, you know, I was torn between enjoying the beauty of these forests and its habitat and seeing friends, families, you know, potentially losing their livelihoods. So, you know, like here in Brazil, the, the United States struggles with this balance of conservation of public lands and creating viable livelihoods for those populations that, that live off of the forest. And, and the US Forest Service was in the middle of that issue and played a big role in, in, in resolving it. And, and I think that, you know, it's these sorts of experiences and background that the US Forest has that, that bring the lessons learned and, and, and the best practices that really help our Brazilian partners in figuring out how do you promote sustainable use of, of Brazil's rich natural resources while conserving critical biodiversity in the Amazon. Um, so, you know, I think that uh, this is a great example of, of how the United States and Brazil is looking at common issues and common problems and partnering to learn together on, on, on how to deal with them. Um, I, some of us, you know, heard, heard a preview of, uh, of the discussion uh, that's gonna take place now uh, yesterday and I think you're going to be really pleased with the panelists' discussions. Um, they've got lots of great lessons learned and best practices that you're going to hear about um, that can definitely be adapted in, uh, in other parts of the world. So, so thank you for your time. And, and thanks to each and every person here who's committed to biodiversity and, and conservation in the Amazon. And I uh, wish you all the best. Uh, happy holidays. And, and all the best in the coming years, in the coming new year. Thank you. Thank you, Ted, for your comments, for the support of AID, and also for that testimonial on that challenge uh, that we face in the United States and that Brazil faces on balancing extractivism, uh, use of products from protected areas, and also the conservation and value of the environmental services of those non-consumptive uses. And there's no better agency around the world to talk about that balance uh, than a representative from the US Forest Service, which has as its motto, the land of many uses uh, for its areas, for its 155 national forest and 20 national grasslands. So I'm pleased to introduce Michelle Zweed of the US Forest Service International Programs to provide a bit more context and specifics about the partnership uh, for the conservation of Amazon biodiversity. Michelle leads the Brazil program uh, for the US Forest Service International Programs. Michelle? Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Ted. Appreciate, appreciate it. It's very nice to be here today. Um, just want to say good afternoon to everybody. Um, want to thank the Colorado State University and USAID and ECMEBU for the long-term partnership with the US Forest Service. I would love to list all of the partners um, we've had so many. We have University of Montana represented today um, by Steve McCool on the, uh, as a panelist, and we're just so happy to have you all here today, and good to see everybody that's, um, you know, participating um, as, you know, as participants um, from our Brazilian colleagues to U.S. to a lot of our international colleagues around the world that have participated in our international seminar. So welcome, and thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'd like to thank the panelists for your time and dedication and the years of support um, within this collaboration. It has, it has truly been um, a wonderful experience and will continue to be. The Forest Service is going to be um, working in Brazil for many years to come. 
and um, with, with the variety of partnerships that we have. Um, as some of you may already know, the U.S. Forest Service manages national forests and grasslands for sustainable multiple uses um, to meet the diverse needs of people and also to ensure the health of our natural resources, provide recreational opportunities, which, you know, is some of what we're going to be talking about today. Also, uh, managing wildlife, guarding against invasive threats, um, working with, you know, cities and communities. Um, but also talking, we'll talk about today, which is international cooperation. Um, the US Forest Service has been um, a partner um, with USAID and the Brazilian government for over 25 years. Um, we extend technical cooperation by applying our 115 years of experience in managing over 77 million hectares of um, national forests and grasslands across the United States. Um, also really want to mention that we, um, we also bring lessons learned um, to the partners um, in other countries. Um, it's a unique opportunity to bring land managers together. And I know we have a lot of folks that have traveled to Brazil from the US Forest Service and also um, folks from our colleagues from Brazil that have um, been part of exchanges um, with land managers, bring them together from both countries to share common challenges, lessons learned and opportunities for improving land management for the benefits of local communities and conservation. It's a wonderful experience um, working with our Brazilian colleagues at ICMEBU. Um, they have such dedication, knowledge and enthusiasm for their work in federal protected areas. So it's a, it's a unique opportunity when we bring land managers together and combine that with a lot of our university partnerships, our university partners in Brazil, like Ponta Grossa University, our universities in the US to build curriculum and to share um, uh, capacity building opportunities. Over the past six years, the US Forest Service through our partnership um, for the conservation of Amazon biodiversity, you'll hear it referred to as PCAB. Um, this program, um, the ISMI BU and the Forest Service um, have joined together to support um, the improvement of livelihoods in the Amazon, Amazonian protected areas by strengthening value chains for forest-based products sourced from these areas. Um, and as Ted mentioned, um, we've been improving the prevention and management um, of fire and in Brazil, working with these federal, federal agencies, IBAMA, ICMEBU, FUNAI, um, and, and, and other organizations. Um, this is an area that we're going to be growing and expanding over the years. And also, which is what we're gonna be talking about today is demonstrating public use and best management practices for connecting Brazilians with their natural and cultural heritage through interpretive programs, capacity building, and enhancing professional um, skills to protect biodiversity and protected areas. I did also want to mention we've worked with ICMEBU on management planning, and that's been with some very key support from our U.S. National Park Service. Um, they've provided wonderful support from the Denver Service Center and exchanges on management planning. So um, this is really a two-way street. I think a lot of people see this, and our Forest Service colleagues. We've brought a lot of lessons learned back home. We've applied them in our national forest system. Seminars and training events developed with ECMEBU have led to the establishment of curriculum for US Forest Service employees. So that was a very exciting um, opportunity that the Forest Service um, engaged in. Um, and also, you know, bringing back, um, you know, some of our applied knowledge and what, have, what we've learned in other countries back to the US as, we've, um, as we go back to our daily work on um, the national forest system. So I really wanna thank everyone for being here today and I wish everybody a very um, happy holiday season and, uh, and a happy new year. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. So with that context and background, uh, let's go ahead and start with our panel. We have invited a small group of panelists. They're now very close friends after working with them uh, over five years uh, on the implementation of this effort in Brazil. And, and they were involved in different aspects of the work. So I'm gonna present them now before we jump into their comments and questions. So the first is Bonnie Lippitt. Uh, Bonnie is a retired recreation, tourism and interpretation specialist 
uh, with the U.S. Forest Service. Now based in the Pacific Northwest region of the United States, she played a key technical role in all aspects of the public use program, including the demonstration sites at Tapajos National Forest and Analipillanas National Park. Aside from her, we have Paulo Faria. Paulo is an environmental analyst for the Chico Menges Institute for Biodiversity Conservation, Isimi Bio. During the period of implementation of this partnership, Paulo had the position as coordinator of planning and structuring visitation and ecotourism for the agency nationwide. Now he is working at the Right Whale Environmental Protection Area in Southern Brazil. And our third panelist is Dr. Steve McCool. Dr. McCool is a professor emeritus from the University of Montana and is a globally recognized and widely published expert in public use planning for protected areas. He and colleagues from the University of Montana played an important role in capacity building and public use planning components of the partnership. So I'm gonna start off with a specific question for each of the three of you, starting with Bonnie. Bonnie, this webinar is specifically about the public use component of the overall partnership for conservation of Amazon biodiversity in Brazil. Can you please provide us with an overview of the main subcomponents of the public use program? Yes, I'd be happy to. And good morning to everyone. Uh, it is morning here. Uh, and it's great to see lots of familiar names and uh, also to hope to meet the rest of you at some point in the future. So when we thought about the public use program and really this work actually began before PCAB initiated uh, back in about 2012, uh, we, we looked at public use through three levels or three different lenses and each of those levels had its own component. And I'll mention them briefly now and then touch on them a little more in detail. So there was a component related to the agency ECMBO that we were working with. Uh, there was a level that was related to public use. What, what about public use? How are we going to structure the learning of that area? And then the third level was what were the capacity building components that we were going to apply to the effort. And before we jump into those, I will mention that all three of those levels were in play pretty much the entire time simultaneously and that there was a tremendous amount of integration between all the different levels and components I'll touch on. And then the second part of that is many of the ECMBO folks that have moved into some of the professional core teams that were established for the agency, uh, they can attest to this because they were often participating in most of these levels and components at the same time as well. So for ECMBO, um, we had to be thinking about how to build capacity at an institutional level, but at the same time also how to build individual capacity, both for employees and for individual protected areas. And I'm going to leave it at that because my colleague and friend Paolo is going to talk in more detail about that. The second area was the public use program itself. And it's often easy to think about the activities that constitute public use, trails, interpretation, concession operations, et cetera. And we did have some activity areas that we used throughout the project, uh, but, but we focused the components of our work on a more functional level. And there were five functions we really wanted to ensure took place. The first was planning, how to plan for public use at a variety of scales. The second component was development. How do you actually develop the facilities, projects, products, services that are gonna deliver on that plan? The third component really got down to the, the nuts and bolts, day-to-day -day operations of how to operate and maintain these programs, facilities, and services, both in the short term and then also in the midterm and long term, because we wanted to promote sustainable public use programs for the agency. The fourth component was monitoring, and we needed to put into place uh, techniques and uh, guidelines for monitoring and measuring impacts, both positive and negative, 
uh, both uh, ecologically, economically, and also socially. And then the fifth component were those support activities that were gonna help also contribute to this overall effort. And that included things like partnerships, engaging with volunteers, how to operate business, uh, for business uh, relationships, et cetera. So those were the five components that we structured a lot of our work on through the, through the eight years and particularly with intentional focus in the last five years. The last area was, you know, what are the capacity development techniques we're gonna use? And I'm just gonna mention them because my colleague Steve is gonna go into more detail on those as part of his comments. So we needed to build technical skills. We also needed to provide opportunities for hands-on applied experiences. We needed to think about institutional level strengthening and the policies and, and procedures that might need to be developed. And then overlaying all of those was the sequential and steady development of leadership skills, particularly in the areas of critical thinking and also in the area of building that confidence so that ECMBO could stride out knowing that they had the capabilities and the skill and the confidence to deliver this program. So those were the levels we worked at. Those were the components of those. And we'll go into more detail on them as different panelists discuss the questions that come next. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. And now I'd like to turn to Paolo. Paolo, could you please expand on Bonnie's overview and share a few of the specific accomplishments or impacts of the program that have really supported and contributed to ISIMI-BIO and to public use in protected areas in Brazil. Obrigado, Jean. É um prazer estar aqui novamente celebrando né, esses resultados de tantos esforços de tantas pessoas que trabalharam no âmbito da nossa parceria, né? É, Para começar, complementando, né, a, a, a fala da Boni. Eu acho que é importante destacar que não é um exagero dizer que os investimentos da parceria é, foram muito protagonistas na construção daquilo que o Brasil tem hoje como visão de uso público e de desenvolvimento de uso público nas unidades de conservação federais brasileiras. Né? Porque apesar dos investimentos serem focados, da parceria, né? terem sido focados nas unidades amazônicas, nós desenvolvemos processos que impactaram positivamente o desenvolvimento do uso público em todas as unidades de conservação do território brasileiro. Né? Alguns números eles acabam chamando atenção e são bons pontos de partida. Né? Durante os cinco anos de parceria, nós praticamente dobramos a demanda de visitação nas unidades no Brasil inteiro, chegando ano passado a mais de 15 milhões de visitas, né? contra em torno de 7 milhões no primeiro ano da parceria. E a proporção de aumento foi muito semelhante na Amazônia, né? onde nós, nas unidades dentro do bioma amazônico administradas pelo ICMBio, a gente chega a um número próximo do meio milhão de visitas. Né? E tem alguns outros números, indicadores, que são interessantes e refletem esses resultados é, objetivos que a parceria preocupou em investir. Nós trabalhamos muitos anos lado a lado, então, o ICMBio, junto com os companheiros parceiros das agências norte-americanas, destacadamente, o Serviço Florestal dos Estados Unidos, o Serviço de Parques também em algumas ocasiões, e as universidades americanas que construíram junto conosco um conjunto extenso e importante de marcos técnicos, que hoje referenciam a tomada de decisão e os investimentos e implementação do uso público em diferentes unidades. Alguns destaques podem, podem ser dados, né? por exemplo, com a adaptação de métodos americanos consagrados, tanto para o planejamento de trilhas, né, que são elementos de infraestrutura básica para o desenvolvimento da visitação nas unidades, mas também a adaptação do ROVUC, né, o Hall de Oportunidades de Visitação, Unidades de Conservação, também adaptado de métodos consagrados do ROS, do Serviço Florestal dos Estados Unidos, e que hoje não só subsidia e referencia o planejamento do uso público nas unidades, mas também é usado como referência, inclusive, para o desenvolvimento dos nossos modelos de concessões e negócios nas unidades mais visitadas do país. Então, todo o trabalho ele foi feito a partir de uma estratégia importante né, de capacitação, foram centenas de é, é, servidores do ICMBio né, que participaram de capacitações extensivas e hoje a gente conta com um grupo de profissionais 
dentro do ICMBio, distribuídos por todo o território brasileiro, que tem diferentes especialidades dentro né, desse universo que é a gestão da visitação, como planejamento de uso público, como foi falado, monitoramento da visitação, a interpretação ambiental, o planejamento e manejo de trilhas, entre outros importantes temas. É, um ponto importante também de destaque do monitoramento é quando a gente começa é, a, a parceria para a conservação da biodiversidade na Amazônia, tínhamos cerca de 50 unidades de conservação, exatamente 54 unidades com a visitação monitorada no país. Esse número, a partir do advento de normas, referências e manuais que foram construídos no contexto da parceria, saltou ano passado para mais de 130 unidades de conservação com a visitação monitorada, compreendida, melhor compreendida, nos dando condições de tomarmos decisões mais estratégicas para criar essas pontes com a sociedade, abrir mais, mas abrir melhor as unidades de conservação para visitação, envolvendo sempre né, os parceiros privados, as comunidades e também é, os, os visitantes, usuários em geral. Né? Ah, um, um, um ponto de destaque também colocado ali pela Boni, que eu gostaria de dar mais um, uma, uma, um destaque aqui na fala, foi essa troca, inclusive, no contexto das oficinas internacionais, visitas técnicas que foram feitas né, nos Estados Unidos <coughs> e também aqui no Brasil, e a participação nos seminários internacionais da Universidade de Montana e da Universidade Estadual do Colorado. Esse conhecimento em loco ele ajudou a, a, a fazer com que nós ganhássemos muita escala no processo de desenvolvimento desses marcos ao conhecer é, grandes exemplos, né, ou bons exemplos, de, de manejo de áreas protegidas e diversificação de oportunidades de uso. Então, esse foi um trabalho bastante extenso, bastante amplo, que envolveu no ICMB centenas de profissionais, nas agências americanas e universidades americanas também, muitos profissionais que construíram ombro a ombro durante esses anos, praticamente o processo que nós conhecemos hoje no ICMB de abertura das unidades de conservação para o uso público. Obrigado, Jim. Thank you, Paulo. And now I'd like to turn to Steve. Uh, Dr. McCool, you have been involved in protected area public use and tourism projects around the globe. What stands out to you as some of the most lasting impacts from the public use component of this program in Brazil? Unmute, Steve. Still muted, Steve. Aaron, can you help on this? Oop. Okay. <laughs> I think that's okay. Uh, thank you, Jim. I'm I'm um, down in my basement in Montana, where it's about three or four degrees Celsius, and uh, the weather keeps changing, and so I get dark and light, so I apologize for that. Uh, first, I would like to say that this has been a wonderful experience, and that was made even better by the motivated and competent staff of ECMBO, and because we had a continuous set of different learning experience and, and both uh, Bonnie and Paulo have alluded to that. But because of this, we we're able to build uh, the relationships that are fundamental for capacity development. And I would just like to say that when, when I first started out, everyone was a stranger. And then they moved and became colleagues. And then they became friends. And it's these friendships that I feel capacity development is really based upon. Now, to get to Jim's question, uh, there are a lot of these impacts and lasting impacts that occurred and lessons learned. And I'm just gonna, uh, because of time, talk about a few of them. Uh, we emphasize in our capacity development learning, and that may seem such a uh, uh, funny thing to say, but the issue uh, of critical thinking and the critical thinking skills that are necessary to operate in a world of, of turbulence and change that confronts protected areas in the 21st century. 
this critical thinking is need, needed to work our way through all the surprises that, that we have, including as we've all experienced the COVID crisis that we are, are now, we now have. So that's one of them. Um, we worked, the second one is that we worked together as partners in implementing the courses, the workshops, and the projects. Uh, the courses were facilitated, which, which was mainly my involvement, were facilitated by a variety of United States instructors, including both the Forest Service and the National Park Service and university staff. I work at the University of Montana and several of our staff came, but other universities were also involved. And these partners included ECMBO staff as well. They were equal to this and they facilitated these courses as well. And so these, this partnership is very important in the capacity development uh, step. And that's a lessons learned that I think goes to other places around the world. Having a common vision, and again, uh, Bonnie mentioned that uh, briefly, of uh, what we were eventually seeking, and we were seeking enhancing the connections between Brazilians and their public lands, between Brazilians and their protected areas. Um, that vision is very important, and this was a shared vision, and there's nothing most power, more powerful in an organization that a shared vision. That's when a vision is shared, that's why people go to work. And that's why they work long hours and little, at little pay and in difficult situations, I might say. And then um, this public use planning um, that we talked about in the courses is actually the foundation for communities and private sector uh, to provide services and opportunity, opportunities for visitors. So Paolo mentioned ROVUC, uh, which is the range of opportunities for visitors on units of conservation, the Portuguese version of that. We can, as public uh, servants, we can lay out what that ROVUC is, but it's going to be communities and the private sector that's actually going to take advantage of that. And by the way, uh, this, uh, this came from the US, the ROS, the idea, it was adapted first for Latin America in general, then for Brazil specifically. But uh, it was also, I was working in um, Croatia. It's been used in Croatia very similar to the way that it's been used in Brazil. So it spread it that uh, further. <clears throat> um, the classes in, the, in uh, public use planning, visitor impact management that we held we're based on a, a philosophy of learning by doing. And I think uh, Bonnie talked a bit about that. And they were based on that and they were based on adult education principles. So they looked at uh, uh, these principles of educational science before they were developed or as they were being developed. So um, I think I'll end there, Jim, and let us go on there. Thank you, Steve. I'd now like to ask a couple of general questions to our three panelists. Uh, and uh, we're already at 1040 on the hour. So it might end up that I ask each of you just one of these questions to make sure we have a bit of time for questions at the end. So I'd first like to ask uh, uh, Bonnie, are there any specific lessons learned that you would like to highlight and share with our audience today. And these might be specific to the partnership in Brazil, or they might be lessons learned that have applicability globally. Thank you, Steve. Yes, uh, we list a number of lessons learned specific to the project in the synthesis document. So when I thought about this question, I, I stepped back to, to think, okay, what's overarching? And I have three items. And the first is the mantra, integrate, integrate, integrate. What made this work successful was not just having partners that all agreed, but we integrated our work and we integrated it across many different platforms and levels. And so the, it takes time and it takes effort to integrate but it is, it, was, it is and was critical to the success of this project and others. 
The second was that uh, we've mentioned at different folks at different times, sort of this vision that we had about, uh, and it was a big vision um, for ECMBO. And it was also a long-term vision and it was very aspirational. So when we started even back in 2012, thinking about this, we didn't even know if we were gonna get funding the next year, let alone year after that, let alone entering into a five-year agreement. But we thought long-term and then worked our way back to say, what, if we're gonna get here, what do we need to do and how long do we need to do it and how do we need to sequence? what we're doing so that we arrive at that point. And then the last part I think is that beyond the partnership, beyond this project, what really is important is thinking about collective action. It, it is important to learn. It is important to create best practices, but really it's important for all of us to understand that collective action, working together towards a common goal that's bigger than all of us, and making a difference is really important. And we need to think about that. And that collective action sometimes is hand in hand doing a workshop together. And sometimes it's each taking the part that we can do best, but it's always trying to work in alignment and to reduce or eliminate working at cross purposes. And so those were the messages that I took from this and they reinforced my experiences in other places, but they were critical to our success. Thank you, uh, Bonnie. And Steve, I'd now like to ask you that same question. Then I'm going to ask another question to, uh, to Paolo. So Steve, what are some of the take home points of the key lessons learned, both for public use in Brazil and that knowing that you work globally, that should be applied uh, by our colleagues around the world? Well, I'd have to echo what Bonnie said, first, first of all. Um, and this, um, uh, but I will take a little, uh, take a couple of minutes to mention something about her last point. Um, and that is this collective or joint uh, action. And that doesn't mean that everyone does the same thing. Everyone in these kinds of efforts has a distinctive role and brings a distinctive uh, expertise. And it's, put, it's um, putting these things together in a way that makes sense for a particular project. In my case, it was for a particular class that ah we brought in some forest service people which and by the way were were liked a lot by the participants and they had a lot of practical experience whereas i had a lot of the conceptual experience and we're able to put these two together um there, well there were more than just the two of us and in a way that made sense to the participant and so this, this collective action where people's different um, strengths are recognized so that you don't have one person trying to talk about everything. And that to me is very important, uh, not only for Brazil, but for other cultures and nations as well. Thank you, Steve. And, and now I'd like to turn to, to Paulo. Paulo, you're a Brazilian civil servant. And you've had the opportunity to work both in the headquarters in Brasilia and also in field units among the over 300 protected areas that uh, ICMBO manages across Brazil and its many biomes. So from that perspective of someone who's been an active participant, who's worked in headquarters, worked in the field, traveled widely internationally to also observe how protect areas are managed in the US and in other countries, the, the partnership achieved a lot as has been mentioned by our, our panelists and by our speakers so far throughout the phase one of the program. But thinking towards the future, thinking uh, as far as a future vision, uh, what's next? What do you see as unfinished, finish, uh, unfinished business, excuse me, as what might be some of the next challenges that the partnership tackles over the next five years? Acho que um dos grandes aprendizados que tivemos é que, em primeiro lugar, muitos dos desafios, apesar de sermos nações diferentes, contextos socioeconômicos diferentes também, muitos dos desafios para a gestão das áreas protegidas, eles são muito semelhantes. E, claramente, a gente observa como uma tendência global é que não, não há possibilidade de uma gestão efetiva de áreas protegidas, de unidades de conservação, como chamamos no Brasil, 
sem a participação próxima e efetiva da sociedade. Essa é uma tendência é, muito forte que a gente observa nos Estados Unidos e que a gente observa no Brasil e no mundo também. Aqui no Brasil, a gente viu um aumento, né, de, se é que podemos falar assim, mas da, da, do desenvolvimento e da prioridade da matéria, uso público, unidades de conservação na gestão dessas áreas protegidas e na gestão do ICMBio ao longo dos anos. E a tendência é que nós tenhamos que continuar fortalecendo essa relação entre área protegida e sociedade, continuando investindo em maior abertura das unidades de conservação e melhor abertura das unidades de, de, de conservação, fortalecendo a ponte né, entre as políticas públicas de conservação da biodiversidade com os negócios, com os parceiros privados, com as comunidades, com os voluntários. Esse é um aprendizado é, bastante amplo, se aplicou muito a essa, essa evolução de visão aqui na gestão é, do ICMBio e na gestão brasileira, e que a gente compartilha, né, nós brasileiros, americanos e demais nações parceiras. Olhar para o futuro, olhar para o futuro da parceria, uhum. sem dúvida nenhuma, ele está relacionado ainda a permanecer olhando para o desenvolvimento das ações de uso público e de abertura das unidades de conservação. Thank you so much, Paulo. And I think that's so true that what we're seeing in international agreements, meetings around the world is this trend toward more partnerships uh, with the private for-profit sector, with uh, private nonprofit groups, with universities, and of course with communities, be these tribal peoples, uh, peasant communities, people of color, any group that might be living within, as often happens in Brazil or around the protected areas, and looking for ways to build these partnerships because we have learned uh, over the past few decades that no agency, public or private, is capable of managing effectively any protected area on its own without partnerships. And that's what uh, this particular initiative has been all about. So thank you very much, Paulo. I'd like to now uh, turn to uh, our colleague Suleni Cotto uh, of the U.S. Forest Service Brazil program, who's been monitoring the questions and answers, and to ask her to please uh, relate to us the questions posed by the audience, and then we'll ask our panelists to answer them. Sue. Olá, boa tarde a todos. Está todo mundo me ouvindo? Boa tarde, é uma alegria estar aqui, ver tantos companheiros aqui de jornada desses anos de trabalho, muito obrigada. É, temos ótimas perguntas aqui, mas em função do nosso tempo a gente tem que selecionar poucas. Eu selecionei duas aqui que eu acho que são bem pertinentes aqui para essa discussão. Sue, I'm sorry, we're not hearing the English translation. I'm not sure what... Now we Yes. No? Is that okay? Está tudo bem? Posso continuar? Ok. É, então, tem uma pergunta aqui muito boa que eu vou direcionar para a Bonnie, que é em relação à a, a experiência que resultou da parceria como uma maneira do Serviço Florestal Americano gerenciar o uso público nos Estados Unidos. É, a pessoa que fez a pergunta quer saber se alguma coisa pode ser aplicada no, nos Estados Unidos, no Serviço Florestal Americano. Você gostaria de responder, Bonnie? Sure. So... I believe what we learned um, and what I've brought back and many of my colleagues who spent time in Brazil and or colleagues that have done other international assignments is that our system is, was set up to protect landscapes and it was done a long time ago. And the thinking that you're also engaging in the communities other than just providing work wasn't really something that was built in to what we've done. And here we go to places like Brazil and like Tapajós where we had our demonstration site where you know there's there's many communities legally 
residing inside a protected area. And so learning to work in a different way and bringing some of those complexities that many other countries face and or concepts like zonas de amortiguimento, you know, buffer zones that communities may be part of is really something that we have been able to think about and bring back here and try to engage in uh, more fully. I would also say that in some cases, all of us are trying to figure out how to explore co-management scenarios with tribal entities. And that takes different shapes and forms, but we're all trying to do a better job and learn from each other. So those are a few examples that come to mind for me uh, right away. Muito obrigada, Bonnie. Ótimas colocações. Agora tem uma outra pergunta aqui que eu gostaria de dirigir para a Michele e talvez com a participação do Paulo Faria, que é com relação aos indicadores que o programa usou para medir o progresso né, nos, diferentes nos diferentes níveis em que o programa trabalhou. Então, quais foram os indicadores que foram medidos diretamente pelo programa, né, pelo Serviço Florestal Americano, e quais os indicadores, pelo menos alguns né, mais importantes que possam ser citados, que foram medidos pelo ICMBio? Você pode responder, Michele, e o Paulo também, pelo ICMBio? Thank you. It's uh, a good question. This is um, a program that was supported financially by uh, the US Agency for International Development. So the indicators uh, we selected are some of the standard indicators that we report on um, for USAID, but also develop some custom indicators. I'll focus more on the indicators that we established under the public use program, which included the number of hectares under improved management um, number of people trained, but not only trained, how many are actually applying um, knowledge um, on the ground and the tools on the ground, number of laws, policies, regulations established, um, number of, and then as I said, number of uh, groups of people applying techniques and knowledge. We also counted the number of management plans established um, in, the, um, in the federal protected area system. Thank you. Complementando a Michelle, internamente no ICMB, uma série de indicadores, tanto de esforço como indicadores objetivos de resultado, nós monitoramos nesse período, né? sobretudo é, a demanda da visitação que foi citada, a quantidade de unidades de conservação que eram monitoradas, mas também alguns indicadores como quilômetros de trilhas, é, variedade de atividades, modalidades de, de atividades recreativas ofertadas para a população e unidades de conservação com seus instrumentos de planejamento, como plano de uso público ou portarias correlacionadas vigentes, para citar alguns exemplos. Muito obrigada, Paulo. Muito obrigada, Michele. É... Jim, nós temos tempo para mais uma pergunta? Yes, we do for one question, possibly to Steve, if there are any. É, então, eu tenho uma pergunta aqui que é justamente para ele. <laughs> é, I got off easy. <laughs> e é uma pergunta que está relacionada com o programa de interpretação. Deixa eu abrir ela aqui, talvez a Bonnie também possa dar um, uma, uma opinião sobre isso. É, sobre o, a longa tradição do, do programa de interpretação nos Estados Unidos, né? interpretação histórica, cultural, que inclui alguma coisa que a gente não tem no Brasil. Por exemplo, é, interpretação cênica em teatros de história pública. E aí você acha que aqui no Brasil a gente teria como... Você acha que funcionaria esse tipo de, 
interpretação aqui, interpretação cultural ou do patrimônio nos sítios históricos, é, nas terras indígenas. Você quer responder, Steve? <laughs> Or Bonnie. <laughs> she's, she's more of an expert on interpretation for me. I can say that, uh, but I'll just, and I'll say a couple just sentences and then turn it over to Bonnie. Um, you know, I went, one of the trips I made down to uh, the Amazon, I, I stopped off and uh, watched a play in the, in the opera house there. And this, this actually was a play for children. And uh, I, I remember saying, what can we design plays that for children that have some theme around natural resources? And if, it's, if it, we have creative writers and directors, I think that would work very well. But that's all I have to say. I'll turn it over to Bonnie. Hi. So I think this is really a, an important question, and it gets to the, that idea of what are best practices, how you adapt them, and then moving forward, realizing that basically as of you know February of this year, everything changed fundamentally and dramatically. And so even though we've had some best practices and in interpretation, and depending on the resources an agency has, had the ability to create more complex and more costly products and services, that doesn't mean that things that are simpler or more direct uh, are any less effective. So I think, first of all, focus on effectiveness. I also think there's gonna be a tremendous change in how we think about delivering interpretation virtually going forward. And that's not something that's going to change once the pandemic is addressed. And it's, it's incredibly, you know, on one hand, it's hard to sit here and have everyone in different places. It'd be fun to be together. On the other hand, think of the global reach we're able to have in just an hour. And so I really think that this is one of those answers also to the question of where do we go from here? Let's not measure what we're doing based on what we've done in the past. We need to stop and think about the pandemic and what of those best practices worked, whether it's interpretation or trails, you know, should they be two-way trails or maybe looping trails that you can make one way. There's gonna be things that we need to look at, review, figure out what we should carry forward, whether it's movies and things like that or not, or podcasts or whatever it is, what doesn't serve us anymore uh, going forward? And what are some of the new media that we might need to venture into that we've never done before? So I think, you know, in all of the areas of public use, whether it's interpretation or trails, we need to ask that question going forward. What about our best practices has changed? What have we learned from the pandemic and how, how the public has responded? And so what do we need to adapt going forward? Thank you to all of our panelists for the, your answers to the questions. I'd like to also thank several of our participants who in the chat have added links or have talked about additional references, for example, on this concept of living history. We have folks uh, uh, on from the National Association of Interpretation, which recently held an international conference in Brazil for the first time. Uh, they have a lot of uh, materials available. And I personally have seen living history and, and uh, seen interpreters enact historic characters in several countries in Latin America. So in answer to our question from Antonio Lisboa about that, that is certainly something that could have applicability in Latin America. Bonnie, we've tried not to talk about COVID during the past hour, but uh, thank you also for those comments on how uh, the world will, will hopefully build back better and build back differently. Uh, and certainly there will be more things done, uh, 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 not live, but uh, online uh, as we're doing right now. We had 110 people at our peak this morning, listening even from Africa, Asia, and Europe. Uh, so this is an example how the reach is spreading. At the same time, I just got off a call before this one with the superintendent of US Park, who said that both in October and in November, in the midst of this pandemic, his park is setting records for visitation without any international visitation whatsoever, which is usually
actually a huge component. So that uh, we also certainly are going to see a lot of pressure for us to do things in person, socially distanced, even in the near future. Well, we're running out of time, folks. So I wanna thank uh, a, a number of people for making this possible uh, as we come to a close. Thanks, first of all, to Ted Gear, uh, Director of USAID Brazil, and to Michelle Zweed, uh, Director of uh, US Forest Service International Programs uh, Brazil efforts for helping to start off and provide context and for the leadership of their institutions in this partnership on the US side. I'd like to really thank our three panelists, Bonnie, Paulo, and Steve for your contributions. I'd like to thank, uh, in addition, our world-class simultaneous interpreters. Uh, I don't know if any of you had been on something done in three languages at once before, uh, but today uh, it worked almost flawlessly. So thank you to our wonderful team of simultaneous interpreters in the three languages from the Brazilian organization Parlari. I'd like to thank my colleagues, Ryan Fincham, co-director of our center at CSU, and Aaron Hicks from our center, and also Lorena Brewster and Sue Cotto from uh, US Forest Service International Programs Brazil uh, for their efforts behind the scenes. And thanks to all of you that are watching from around the world in different time zones in the morning, afternoon, and evening. Uh, we have a lot going on in our lives right now, including an overload of Zoom webinars uh, and things online. So thank you very much for taking time out of your day to participate. Uh, Aaron has put a link to a, a questionnaire uh, in the chat. We'd really appreciate if before signing off, each of you could uh, help us improve our webinars for the future. Uh, our center will have an entire series of additional webinars uh, in English and Spanish next year uh, on different topics related to protected area management with sponsorship from the Forest Service. So we hope this isn't the last time we see many of you and we'll be publicizing those widely. And as we close, I'd like to give a special thanks to the US Agency uh, for International Development for their support and collaboration, which made this partnership possible, and to the US Forest Service International Programs and to uh, the Chico Mendes Institute of the Brazilian Federal Government for their trust, for their partnership, for their friendship, and to all of the other university partners online. I see we have partners from the University of West Virginia, uh, from Brazilian universities online. Uh, we've also partnered with Brazilian state and local governments that we haven't mentioned so far. They play a key role in protected area management in Brazil. And to all of the other partners, NGOs in Brazil and the United States, communities that participated actively in the implementation of many of these efforts and in the training, and private sector for-profit uh, collaborators as well, concessionaires, guides in many of the protected areas, and uh, the academic community in Brazil for your partnership. So we wish you all a great rest of your day a happy holiday season, and an even better and eventually COVID-free 2021. Muito obrigado. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much. With muchas gracias a todos. <laughs> obrigado. <laughs> hey, everyone. Hey, everyone. I just want to say thank you. Muito obrigada a todos. Feliz Natal. Quem está falando é Cláudia, intérprete. Muito hey, obrigado. Jim, thank you. That was that was quite a compliment. World class interpretation. Wow. Thank, thank you, Claudinha. And oh, thank, you, thank you, Steve. Thank you. I want I want to say uh, Merry Christmas thank to you all. Feliz you, Natal. Merry Christmas to everybody. Yes. Feliz Natal, Michelle. You look stunning you with this hair. Are, are we still live? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs>